Hello everybody and welcome to another top 10 edition of Magic Mike's. Proudly sponsored by Patreon supporters and CoolStuffInc.com where you can find cool stuff in stock every day and our co-sponsor CardHoarder.com offering the best inventory prices and delivery of cards for Magic Online. I am Evan Irwin and we get started each top 10 by saying hello to my two co-hosts, Ruben Bressler. Oh hi, how are you? Aaron Campbell. Merry Gruelsmas! Merry Gruelsmas everyone! <laughs> Get down to go burn your tree. Yes, we we you know, purposely to planned it to do. Yeah, we planned it to, to do Azorius last week to coincide with Hanukkah, and then we we normally take a step back from the guilds. We try not to do them consecutively. But Ruben brought up the idea that it was too perfect to have red green be the week of Christmas, and so it's Merry Christmas. That's right, red and green, meat and egg, and potato. Oh man, starting them taters right. <laughs> we couldn't even get meat and eggs meat and out. And eggs and potatoes. Yes. Wow. Now it's Christmas. Now it's now it's really good. Now we're feeling like Christmas up in here. That is terrific. So we also begin with our choice of the top comment from last week in a segment we call Honorable Mention, where Ruben will tell us who was the most prolific in letting us know what card we didn't choose as one of our top ten Az Azorius cards. Ruben? Well, our winner this week is uh, Zero Magnum X, who I've seen in our chat a number of times. Hmm. Uh, also has his own YouTube channel. There are many amazing cards on this list. However, I noticed that not one single Planeswalker was chosen. So my vote is for my favorite Planeswalker, if not my favorite card in all of Magic, Venser the Sojourner. This card was a standard all-star and the centerpiece to my very first blue-white control deck. It utilized Elspeth and Venser to produce three tokens every turn, resetting Elspeth's loyalty. However, this card saw quite a bit of play during the Jace the Mind Sculptor times and was a great utility card that tied that sort of control deck together. Venser was just the missing piece. It allowed you to reuse any of your important cards, such as Oblivion Ring. It could reset your other Planeswalkers, could blank Wall of Omens or Spreading Seas, and move nicely into the next format after. Venser also made your creatures unblockable for the turn. Quite a powerful thing to do. That, sadly, was never really explored at its fullest. And that ultimate, well, let's just say most players never lost using that emblem. By far, one of the most powerful five-mana planeswalkers in the game. Smiley face. There you go. So thank you, Zero Magnum X, for the awesome comment. Now, for those who don't know, uh, Vincer the Sojourner is a five-mana Planeswalker. Blue, white, and three generic mana for a three-loyalty Planeswalker from Scars of Mirrodin, where it is a mythic rare. For plus two, you exile target permanent you own. Return it to the battlefield under your control at the beginning of the next end step. Minus one, creatures are unblockable this turn. And minus eight, you get an emblem with whenever you cast a spell, exile target permanent. Yeah. So very, very good. Very solid was definitely on my short list. You know, I was there in Amsterdam at the pro tour when they unveiled it, it was, they were unveiling two things at the same time. It was either they unveiled Elspeth at Amsterdam and Venser in like LA or something or mm. vice versa. But either way, there was that awesome night and they had like a whole DJ and thing. There was a whole party built around new Phyrexia. It was crazy. Nice. Um, but yeah, so Venser was an awesome card. It just got overshadowed more or less. Sure, sure. And what it did was good, but not necessarily that good yeah and we might be seeing a little bit more of Venser or at least his handiwork once Dominaria comes back around uh, if if spoilers are to be believed oh yeah. boy Dominaria is gonna be sweet that's right I'm excited so we're gonna start here with number 10 Ruben what is your number 10 so we're gonna kick things off at number 10 with the gruelest of gruel cards in that it has the Gruel keyword on it. I don't think that there's a ton of cards that are going to be on our lists that have Bloodthirst, but Scab Clan Mauler is the Bloodthirst card mm. from uh, the original Ravnica block where it was good. I mean, it, honestly, Scab Clan Mauler is the, the all-star of all cards that have Bloodthirst. So it's a red and a green, 1-1 one, one, with Bloodthirst 2, and Trample from Guild Pact. And the first of all, the flavor text, I, want, I just want to focus on because I love the flavor text. They inflict pain to forget their own and break foes to feel whole. Because same, to be honest. And <laughs> <laughs> Scat Clan Mauler was the centerpiece of the Gruel Beats deck that was super popular for a really long time. And also, by the way, won a Pro Tour in the hands of Mark Herberholtz. Yeah. Um, 
you know, the, the deck featured lots of red green cards, including Burning Tree Shaman, which uh, didn't make any of our lists. Um, it had Rumbling Slum in it as well. Uh, honorary Gruel card Curd Ape, which might be making an appearance later if you all followed my definition of what a Gruel card means. Um, and of course, something else that'll certainly be higher on our lists that we'll get to. But uh, in particular, this was the two drop of all two drops for the Gruel Beats deck. Scab Clan Mauler, just a, you know, it's all almost always a 3 3 trample for two on turn two, was just the standard for beatdown, and it's just a really good card. It's good in in that you know back in the day it was ridiculous like yes. this was guild pack this was when when creatures were generally terrible and good creatures that were pushed were like wow what what is happening you can't you have a creature that's better than the spells that's weird you know so right. like when it was good it was crazy good and wizards finally started putting the pieces together to give a good aggro deck and Sc scab clan mauler was just the two drop you wanted you absolutely wanted you know what was the right. what was the two one drop was it curd ape first or was it well curd ape and scorched Rasalka were yeah. both available as one drops. Then you could, or you could, uh, Seal of Fire was in the format Seal as well to guarantee there. Bloodthirst. And then later Riftbolt came along to also turn on your, or any other one drop that you happen to have. Right. Uh, you know, any any old one one for one will trigger that Bloodthirst for you. But, uh, but yeah, 3 3 Trampler for two on turn two was no joke back in the day. It's terrific. Aaron, what is your number 10? We use different criteria to form these lists. We pick cards that are good, that have seen tournament play. We pick cards that have seen play across multiple formats. We pick cards that we have personal great appreciation for. My number 10 fits in neither of those categories. <laughs> My number 10 is an awful card, um, which I appreciate because of its awfulness. I appreciate it because of the way that it really, really trolled people. Uh, my number 10 is Ulrich of the Crawling Horde. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. I almost put this at number 10 for the exact same reason. So Ulrich is three a red and a green uh, from Eldritch Moon. Uh, he is a legendary human werewolf, 4-4. Whenever this creature enters the, battle enters the battlefield or transforms into Ulrich, a uh, target creature gets plus plus four plus four until end of turn at the beginning of each upkeep if no spells were cast this turn you can transform him and then he transforms into Ulrich uncontested alpha uh, where he becomes a six six uh, and then uh, you can have him fight so when he transforms into Ulrich he can fight a target non werewolf creature you don't control and the reason why I'm so amused by this card is because people had wanted a legendary werewolf for a really long time going back to the original Innistrad and possibly even farther back than that and it was something that you know Myro had kind of alluded to that you guys are finally going to get this and so when we go back to Innistrad people are going okay we're going to get us that legendary werewolf everything's going to be great and then it kind of fizzles it drops and people are like the record stops and you're like that's 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 a legendary werewolf like and no one played it I don't recall it seeing any play I haven't even seen it in EDH and normally EDH can find a use for anything um, and it was just a dud and I just think it's so funny that this was the thing people were so excited about and it just landed with a thud and now nobody talks about it nobody plays with it and I think that's kind of amusing <laughs> I, I enjoy putting like the booby prizes at number 10 I like you know the sorrows <laughs> paths of the world of yeah. like wow you really screwed that one up like it's yeah. not it's a lord but it doesn't give plus one plus one to things it gives a bonus yeah. that's a one time it doesn't do anything with wolves or make wolves it doesn't make wolves when it transforms instead it fights because that's super werewolfy i mean like i it was so weird it just came out of yeah. freaking nowhere and it was just like that's the best you could do like right. i, I feel like a, a fan design would have been better than any of this I think that that card really paid for the sins of Huntmaster of the Fells. Like, you know, we talk about cards sometimes paying for the sins of other cards, and I feel like that was one of those cards where they knew they had to make a red and green thing. Huntmaster had, he has already seen play in multiple formats and proven itself to be an all-star, and some might even say it's too good for the cost. And I think that this was a card that they really stifled because they didn't want to make another Huntmaster, and so they purposely might have uh, powered, you know, yeah. right, powered it down or numbed it, and I think that was sort of the problem, was it had really big shoes to fill. Yeah, it's just disappointing on on like two or three different levels it's it's disappointing in that it was weighted for us for so long it's disappointing that this is like supposed to be a character in the story and it, it it was just such a disappointing card in addition to the fact that none of the flavor of the card makes any sense whatsoever um yeah ulrich was uh if we ever do like a top 10 disappointments <laughs> of like really this is where we, we might know, come back and get to have this conversation going. again i'm pretty excited about it because it's yeah. always fun when you're like guys it was right there yeah, yeah. yeah. It's so as it's it deserves to be in number 10 for the sake that we get to talk about it. <laughs> well, um, I uh, 
for this one was really interesting for my number 10 uh, because <laughs> because at the time, you know, you got to kind of set this up. This was 2008, okay? It's 2008. Uh, you know, the, the rocks were soft uh, still a little bit, and yep. the creatures were still terrible. And mm-hmm. so there was a creature that they made, and they gave it to Mike Flores to preview. And, oh. and it was so... I almost had this on the list, too. It was so, like... So good. It was so like he had to prep Mike Flores. Mike Flores was, was writing the Swing with the Sharks column. This was the yep. spikiest of spike columns. This was going to be the tournament column with the tournament preview. It came with a note from Wizards that said, Yes, really. They titled he titled the entire article, Yes, really. Tattermunge Maniac sucks. This card <laughs> was terrible. I mean, I'm talking, really it was bad. terrible from like the get go. It wasn't even close. It wasn't even like a question. Yep. Tattermunge Maniac is a red or a green hybrid mana. It's just one mana for a 2-1 that attacks each turn if able. It's an uncommon goblin warrior from Shadowmoor, and it was bad. And the reason <laughs> that it was so lauded was that nothing since Jackal Pup, I think, was had ever been printed as a one mana 2-1 that didn't have just, I guess, a straight terrible drawback. I can't even think of any at the moment. But regardless, sure. this was the no drawback, one mana 2-1, but the drawback being it has to attack. But you want to attack, right? That's exactly what you want to do. You're aggro by Bredabra. No, you don't. No, you don't. There's reasons when you don't always attack all the time, and this thing would just plunge in there and die immediately, and it was crap. And it's just attack. It yeah. just killed me. that the, the First of all, the yes really. Second of all, the swim with sharks column. And third of all, just the impact was just a thud. Just <laughs> To this day... Yes, really is the is the most famous preview card article in my brain. Like it's the one I think of. Maybe like challenging it is better than all. Like sure. oh, it's that's like. But those are the two preview card articles, right? And, and it's just it's just crazy that that this was so hyped. And they were like, not only can you play it in mono red or mono green or both, it's also a goblin for goblin decks. It's a warrior for warrior decks because this was Shadowmoor, remember? So we thing. got those warrior decks coming. <laughs> Um, and, and it was just not good ever at all. It, was so it, was, it lived in a format with lots of other two power, uh, one mana creatures like gold metal stalwart, not to mention like figure of destiny coming along a little bit later in those mono red decks. Um, yeah, it was not, it was not good. It was the poop and we will poop on to number nine. Uh, so for number nine here, I happen to have a number nine buddy. Who's my number wow. nine buddy? <gasps> Me and Aaron, we think about like all the time. It's, yes. It's terrific. I, <laughs> I I love this one. Why don't you tell us about it, Aaron? So I really like cards and, and that can go outside of the color pie, you know, and, and we've certainly talked about that in regards to to other cards. You know, so every once in a while you'll see black gets a counter spell, you know, or you'll see, you know, white getting a counter spell or doing something it's not supposed to. And, you know, this card really exemplifies that in that it gives two colors the ability to do something that it normally uh, is not able to do. Uh, my number nine is our, our number nine is guttural response. Yeah. <laughs> Screw you, counter spells. That's right. <laughs> And why don't you tell the folks what it does? It's a one mana, red or green hybrid mana for an uncommon from Shadowmoor. Turns out we're just you know run through the run through the list. Yeah. Guttural response is an uncommon instant that has one line of text: counter target blue instant spell. Done. The end. Period. Love it. Seriously, red and green is countering spells. Blue people's minds freak people out. Saw some, saw lots of play. There was a yeah. this is a world of cryptic of command. This is a I... world of cryptic command. Mm-hmm. And and it yeah, was yeah. amazing. I Being love the counter cryptic commands was a huge deal. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say I really love the. Uh, they recently reprinted it in the dual decks, mind versus might, which we love to poke fun at because as as a whole it was terrible. But it has this really great art of basically a gorilla in a suit of armor just holding a broadsword, uh, running down a snowy path, and the flavor text says a savage cry with the power to shatter minds. And I love that art so much. And even the previous art is pretty nifty, you know, sort of showing this gruel almost slicing through something, this energy slicing through um yeah i love sure. yeah you know i really love that they played around with this you know we're, we're seeing red do things with drawing cards and exiling now and green is the ability to like destroy non-creature permanence and i think this is great and i don't think i don't think we've really seen anything out of these two colors like this like, i don't well i don't know if we've had i mean particularly since that block because this was fighting for me with Vexing Shusher, which is very similar. I don't yes. know if it's on your list, but it's, it's very similar in that vein. It was making things uncounterable versus countering mm-hmm. things. Countering spells by green just with one green mana is a yeah. weird thing. It's a strange oddity, and well, I love it. 
Go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. No, so sweet. We're, we're, we're starting to see some things, though, uh, a la Carnage Tyrant and Gaia's Revenge. You know, we're starting to see a lot of uncounterable things that are green. And that's sort of green's way of saying, uh, screw you to counter spells. I think it's sort of evolved along the way. Right. Oh, yeah. But this this and Avoid Fate are like the only green ca- and life force, I think, in counter spells. Ah, <laughs> uh, from uh, what? Alpha, right? Sure. Ooh. Why not? Who cares <laughs> at this point? Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, the the the. War yeah. for the Planet of the Apes broadsword art is the only redeeming part of Mind vs. Might for me. Uh, and I've played quite a few guttural responses in my day, uh, ca- countering mostly cryptic commands. Definitely a good choice. Can you do a guttural response, though, Ruben? Because you're pretty. I can. can you? Okay. Do you want me to? Yeah, absolutely. What am it's I responding to? Uh, cryptic burn cryptic. decks are terrible. Ugh! <laughs> <laughs> yes! So, Ruben, what is your number nine? My number nine, uh, you, you guys know that I love cards that win Pro Tours, all right? This one was a four of in a Pro Tour deck, in a real-life Pro Tour deck. It may have been the worst Pro Tour winning deck of all time. Wow. Um, but it won the Pro Tour, and it was a four of, and it also might be the only card in the history of Magic, I'll have to go and look, that has four nouns as the four words in its name. Giant Trapdoor Spider nice. is my number nine. Jeez. Um, most per- perhaps best known as a four of in Ole Rade's Pro Tour Tokyo. No, I'm sorry, not Pro Tour Tokyo. Pro Tour, what was that, Columbus? It was like the third Pro Tour ever. It was like Worlds, maybe? It was in July of 96, and it won the tournament in Red Green Spiders. So what Giant Trapdoor Spider does is as follows. Colorless red green for a 2-3 spider from Ice Age. Pay a colorless a red a gr- and a green and tap, colon, remove from the game, giant trapdoor spider, and target creature without flying that's attacking you. Yeah. Yep. That is a lot of things happening in that text box. Um... It's sure. I mean, I've never seen one cast. I've never cast one myself. But alongside uh, Ole Rade's Deadly Insects and Storm Shamans and another red-green card that may be higher on someone else's list, Stormbind, um, and, you know, the various other sundries of various baubles and, and jockle hopses and incinerates in that deck, won the second or third Pro Tour of all time. Uh, a 16-year-old Ole Rade in his first Pro Tour taking down the entire tournament. Um, it, it just has the pedigree. It's got the provenance, and it's got to be on the list. I, I get I mean, it's, it's, it's also famously known as one of the only spiders that doesn't have reach. Yeah, so sure. it can't actually stop flying creatures, even though it's a spider with webs and supposed to. And I get it. It's a trapdoor trap spider. Under the ground. If, you, if you know your biology, you know that the trapdoor spiders burrow in the ground and have a little trapdoor that when they have an unsuspecting insect walk by and they make their little webs around it so that they can feel the insect walking by. So when the insect walking by, nightmare fuel happens. And I was going to say, we just straight to nightmare fuel. Underneath the earth. Yes. <laughs> Jeez. This is this is literally a Pennywise the clown spider that just wow. brings it down into the sewers. <laughs> Ruben Bressler's science hour here. That's just... right. Wow. If well, you need, if you need weird facts and information, it, Ruben Bressler's your <laughs> among the three of us. I mean, it's you're not going to learn anything from watching Aaron Campbell's streams. <laughs> it, just for just for nostalgia's sake, I have to bring up Deadly Insect. I loved this creature. It was a green and four generic uh, mana for a six one shroud. And that's it. It was just an untargetable monster yep. that could be killed by anything, quote unquote. But you had to have the anything that right. actually hurt it. I mean, do you do this on dates, Ruben? Like, do you just randomly bring up trapdoor spider facts and like? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I definitely, I definitely bring up facts of like just, just co- whatever is off the top of my head. Useless trivia from whatever the topic of conversation is. All right, so we're gonna move on here to. Number- I'm a delight. I'm a delight at parties. <laughs> He, he, he not, truly not is. A delight. I'm really not, not. not. Not the delightiest. Um, all right. So uh, here we are back in another uncommon from Shadowmore uh, that somehow my 10, 9, and 8 were all uncommons from Shadowmore. Uh, wow. Because sometimes for Gruul, you got to get in there. Okay. You got to get in there as fast as possible, as hard as possible for the most efficient cost you could possibly have. In there in Shadowmore, they did some great work. And Boggart Ram Gang is part yeah. of that great work. Yeah. It is, Ram Gang three, is awesome. Three gruel mana. Either red, either green, three mana. 
for a 3-3, Haste, and Wither. Wither says this deals damage to creatures in the form of minus one, minus one counters. This card was awesome from day one. Saw play from yes. day zero. It was super sweet and limited. It was amazing and constructed. It saw tons and tons of play. I, I think, it, you know, if, if you're just like, what is Gruul? What does Gruul do? Meat, eat, you know, meat, eggs, whatever. No, Bargart Ram Gang, through guy, comes into play, tapped, because it's attacking. That's what it does. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, Ram Gang. I have a very specific memory of Ram Gang. Way, way, way back in the day when I still lived in Ohio and still played on the tournament competitive scene here, we had a basically our version of a uh, um, a Pro Tour testing gauntlet where we were supposed to bring decks based around the cards that were coming out in Shadowmoor. I made a deck that was trying to take advantage of Din of the Fire Herd, uh, and it did not pan out. But I remember very. Sp this was folks like Sam Stoddard, uh, Tom Lapilli was still in the area. Um, this I think Gabe Walls was there. Wow. This was like way back in the day in Ohio. And Brian Six, Pro Tour competitor Brian Six, brought a red green aggro deck. And every time you could, you knew what was happening because every time he played a Ram Gang, he would tap his three mana, slam it onto the table, and go. Ram gang and just like did that at least three dozen times throughout the day and it was amazing <laughs> um yeah this card's great i mean it's super super powerful saw a ton of play in red green aggro in jund aggro uh just a super good card oh man ruben what is your number eight my number eight is higher on someone else's list well mm. aaron what's your number eight I'll handle this. Uh, so in our previous episode, uh, the Azorius episode, I talked about having a great appreciation for Dragon Lord Ojitai, which was uh, a card that I, I got a lot of experience with uh, when I was playing Esper Dragons when it was standard legal. Uh, but there's another Dragon Lord that I have a great appreciation for uh, because I don't uh, play a lot of standard, uh, largely because I have to interact. You guys know that's not my jam. I, I really don't. I just want to put up my little wall and very much an only child and do my thing. Uh, and in Battle for Zendikar Standard, there was a ramp deck. There was a green-red ramp deck where you basically played your Sylvan Scrying, you played your your explosive vegetations, and then you just you ramped into things. And, and you really didn't interact. And they were like, Aaron, this is a deck that's perfect for you. And I was like, I'm in. Um, and one of the things you ramped into was my number eight, which was Dragonlord Atarka. Yeah. Uh, so Dragonlord Atarka is five red and a green. She's an 8-8 eight, eight flying trample elder dragon legendary creature like what more do you need out of that um but there's another paragraph there's more uh when she enters the battlefield meaning that you can blinker you can rezzer you can do all sorts of broken things uh when she enters the battlefield she does five damage divided as you choose amongst any number of target creatures and or planeswalkers your opponents control so she's essentially just breathing fire onto the battlefield like how dope is that yeah um, and so being able to do nothing for so many turns and just ramp into her um and then just slam multiple copies of this feels really really good um, you know, there weren't many ways to deal with a creature that big, uh, if I remember correctly, back in that standard. Um, and she was something I was just happy to ramp, ramp into, you know, having trample, having two forms of evasion, essentially. Um, you know, if they do happen to have some little flyers where you're just going to plow right through them. And so this was a really hard creature for people to deal with. I love the flavor of Atarka, but in that she basically just wants people to feed her and leave her alone. And me too, same. Mm -hmm. We talked about having creatures we relate to. Um, and uh, that's why Atarka is my number eight. There was a there was a question of like you know uh, they can print all the fatties they want it doesn't matter because it's just not good in standard it's just it's not good enough and you know what what numbers does it need to be well let me tell you the numbers are seven mana and eight eight and some <laughs> and, stupid crazy ability on top of it yeah. like and flying and, and bone and hell kite yeah. yeah. I mean, it just wrecked everything. It would just show, and just, you know, you were like, please don't have it, please don't have it, and they tap seven, and you're dead. <laughs> like, you just lose in, like, maybe two turns if you're lucky, because yeah. at that point, like, there's there's no stopping Atarka. She's, she's going to come and get you. Yeah. yeah, she was great, and she's still great. She's in the Vintage Cube right now and is still one of the most sought-after creatures for the, the Sneak and Show decks and the Reanimator decks. Definitely a fatty of choice. It can still be cast. It's only seven mana, so uh, se seven is much less than eight when you're trying to cast your giant animals in Cube, um, and especially in Standard when you were able to sort of... There, were, there was a way to jump from two to four to seven, if I recall correctly. There was sort of like an explosive vegetation effect at four that I'm forgetting right now, and you had um, uh, Sylvan carry at it i think 
right. was what you added to. No, there was, was the temple. That, right? that was a thing, I think. But then there was also the temple. There was a temple that gave you two color lists if you had so many lands. Oh, yeah. Not yeah. the temple of the false god, but something that was the, the, the new The, the new temple version. of the false god. That's right. I right. could be yeah, wrong. Yeah. I just, I, that was, it feels like it was, it wasn't that long ago, but it felt, like, not... you could play, it felt like you could play it on turn four. I, okay. I, I, I vaguely remember being able to cast it. At, I mean, you could definitely cast on turn five. I would yeah. say um, five was usual. Anyway, the point is five. five was usual, but the point Jeez. is that it was insane. Regard if you cast Ridiculous. it on seven, it was still usually good. Right, you top decker. It was like, oh my god, how do I stop yeah. this thing? <laughs> yeah. You just died. Yeah. All right, moving here to number seven, Ruben. Do you have one? I do. I have a number seven, and it's a bit of a weird one. And I want to give you guys a bit of a history lesson here. Oh boy! So Ruben whenever snaps. we have, so every year, particularly when there were four pro tours a year, usually one of them is a destination pro tour. Um, and whenever there's a destination pro tour, for those of you that aren't aware, there's usually at least one, sometimes two cards that people don't realize they're going to need a bunch of until it's too late. Um, at the Pro Tour. And so you have uh, price spikes on cards. Pa uh, famous examples of this include Uril the Mist Stalker at mm. the second Pro Tour Honolulu. Uh, went up to like $30 a piece. Wow. Elish Norn was another one that uh, that jumped at that Destination Pro Tour. Sword of War and Peace jumped up to like $40 a piece at the, se at the third Honolulu. But one that really jumped at Pro Tour Tokyo was a common that was going for five dollars a piece the night before the pro tour and it's named yavi maya barbarian hmm. yavi maya barbarian hmm. is a red and a green barbarian elf from invasion it's a common it has protection from blue and that is it that is the extent of what that card does Wow. But it's it's notable for a couple of reasons. First of all, that that uh, that history I just told you um, ab about how they were five dollars a piece on the floor, and never have I seen. I mean, the only time I've ever seen anything close to that was there was a vintage champs where Slash Panthers were going for a lot because that was the new hotness for battling against Jace, and they were like five, they were like twenty five bucks a piece for foils or something ludicrous like that. Anyway, uh, it made the top eight in the hands of Ryan Fuller. Um, it didn't really leave a huge mark on the tournament scene. In fact, there's another red-green card in Ryan Fuller's deck called Raging Kavu uh, that has four of it in the main deck as opposed to Yavi Maya Barbarian where there's only two. But also, this later spawned the next uh, cycle of allied color tutus with protection from their shared enemy. And the next one here was Nakadal Outcast, mm. which I think then was a uh, cat scout instead of a barbarian elf. Uh, but you get my point. So this was part of the Galena's Night cycle in the original Invasion. Um, and, and I just always remembered that story about how Yavi Maya Barbarians were $5 on the floor the night before the Pro Tour started. Well, and it's funny because you, you really kind of only see that sort of the, that's a very cultural specific thing, that sort of price spike right there at the yeah. event, right before it happens. Everyone's talking about it or whatever. Because when I went to Pro Tour Valencia, the first Pro Tour I ever went to, I got there by winning like essentially the popularity contest. They sent me to right. the Invitational. And everyone was freaking out on like the day before, right when it got rained out in the morning of, mm -hmm. over Wax Wayne. Wax mm. Wayne was an uncommon in Invasion. Uh, that ha It's a split card. The Wax destroys for one green. You target creature, go plus two, plus two. For one white, destroys right. target enchantment. And for whatever reason, the, with the metagame, blah, 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 everybody was looking and for this Wax was, Wayne. And it was time shifted, right? Uh, you no. Know. No, no th this was oh, wow. th this uh, this was either uh, I think it was extended was the format. Oh wow, okay. Um, oh, that's right. This was the extended Pro Tour. Yeah. The Chase Rare Control one. Um, when um, with enduring ideal beat uh, with enduring got, ideal got and and the invasion wow. Sacklands got second. That's mm -hmm. right. That was that was the extended Pro Tour. I forgot about it. that. Was right when Venser got printed and it was literally right. Chase Rare Control. It was just all of the all of the expensive cards all in a deck together. I yeah. remember that Venser from. But yeah, that yeah. it's definitely happened before. I remember I went to uh, Grand Prix, the first at least I think it's the first Grand Prix Montreal, which was a time spiral block. Uh, Grand Prix, where I recorded a video for the Magic Show, um, in fact, uh, and I was playing a mono red deck, um, and I brought a stack of delays, and people were looking for delays on the floor, and I was able to get rid of them for $2 a piece. Uncommon wow. delay 
just a stack of them. So I made out like gangbusters there. Uh, that's also the event where I first met AJ Soccer, uh, where we played in round three. And I was playing Mono Red, and he was playing a green-white deck with some new popular, for some reason, some card called Tarmogoyf was becoming popular. Uh, and he beat, beat, beat me quite to death with that thing, because that thing was bigger <laughs> than everything in my deck. Um, and then I died. Uh, but yeah, so uh, so yeah, the the, the price spike um, zeitgeist is kind of interesting in in the world of Magic. All right, so I don't have a number seven; it's higher on someone else's list. I'm guessing it's Rubens. I'm almost one hundred thousand <laughs> sure. But Aaron, do you have a number seven? I do. Uh, so speaking of fatties, I talked about having a great appreciation for. I Drake always like Nord- fatties. There's nothing wrong with, you know, some a couple extra cards in the main deck, as I love right. to say. And yeah. uh, my number seven certainly has that in spades. You know, we talked about Dragon Lord Atarka and specifically her ability to be cheated out. You know, you know me. I don't like to play fair. Like, if I see a mana co- cost and I have to pay full price for it, I'm indignant. Like, I want to be able to cheat. I want to be able to get something out faster than it should be out. Uh, and my number seven is a card that I love to bring in. Uh, this is also something that the Amulet Titan decks like to play uh, in Modern. This is something they look for uh, with, with Summon pact as a way to fight opposing combo decks so that they can uh, win the race. Um, my number seven is Rurik Thar the Unbowed. <laughs> wow. Do you guys say unbowed or unbowed? Is that bowed. just me? I say I say unbowed, but you do. I'm, okay. I'm not unbowed. a word, I mean, I guess I am a word scientist. But. It is unbowed. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. I know, I know Ruben sometimes pronounces things funny, um, so... I put the emphasis on a different syllable sometimes. I mean, in me, I'm Southern. Between me and Ruben, you, you never know what between, you're going to get. Between, yeah, between Evan's Southern roots and my just esoteric nonsense, you never know how we're going to say words. That's why I thought to ask, so thank you. So Rurikthar is uh, from Dragon's Maze, one of the, the high points of that set. Mm. Uh, four colorless, a red and a green, 6-6 six, six, Vigilance Reach, a uh, legendary creature, Ogre Warrior. Uh, Rurikthar, the Unbound, attacks each turn of Fable, which is very gruel. Uh, but then there's a little something on the bottom that says whenever a player casts a non-creature spell, Rurikthar deals 6 damage to that player. And so this is something that you typically want to reanimate against like Storm Decks. Storm Decks just have no way to really beat this. Like, how are you going to get out of this? And this was also something that the Jun decks were using in Ravnica Standard against the Control decks, um, because for them to even do something to deal with it, it's probably going to be a non-creature spell, and they're probably going to take six damage just for trying, which you're happy to to sort of make that trade. And so um, I really like this card. This is something I've reanimated on several occasions, and it always feels great. Uh, it's very underappreciated in that people usually have to read it. <laughs> And then when they do, they're like, ha, huh, next game. Uh, <laughs> I've seen this in Vintage. Sometimes the Oath decks will play this as a way to, again, sort of, uh, in maybe in a mirror or just, you know, another deck that's playing a lot of non-creature spells. You want to be able to slam this, uh, and this deck can very easily carry you home. And uh, that's why it's my number seven. It was, it didn't necessarily, I think, jump on the scene immediately, as I recall. Like, as I recall, it kind of came out and it was like, all right, whatever, this set's terrible if the card isn't named voice of resurgence <laughs> so like who gives a crap you know and then all of a sudden it was right. like it kind of started showing up i think it was either a ramp decks or maybe a cyborg or some aggro decks or something and it was like wait a minute if they cast supreme verdict they're still taking six damage <laughs> like that's okay i'm okay mm-hmm. with this mm-hmm. and and that kind of kind of went from there it also has uh, correct me if i'm wrong but i believe this has reached well certainly back to legacy i've definitely seen it in legacy sideboards particularly in elves which i think is awesome yeah but they just green sun zenith for six and go get a rurik thar because they have a um, difficult time with combo decks too right exactly uh but i'm pretty sure this was an oath target for a minute um just because why not like play, <laughs> anything you know, can be an oath not, target for anything a minute. can be an oath target for for a minute you know what i mean um but yeah, Rurikthar is a great choice. I love that one. And I do believe it is unbowed. Okay. Um, I, I'm trying to parse the sentence of what he isn't bowing to or bowing to. <laughs> because if he isn't bowing, that means that he isn't like warping based on water damage, right? No, like I'm pretty they, sure it's bowing. He isn't in becoming that, like, bowed. He he is the what, the champion of the guild, is that right? Yeah, he doesn't bend the knee. Is that what we're talking about? Right, right. Hello. Right. The I maze know. champion, yeah. Got right. it. So, and that was very close to my top 10 for what it's worth. Um, so we're going to move on here to uh, number six. And I'm just taking a good old fashioned break. It's going to be a minute for, uh, <laughs> before I get to talk about any magic cards. So uh, Ruben, do you have a number six? I don't know how long your break is, but I got a break too. <laughs> Electric break Up oh, top. Oh my God. Aaron, do you have a number six? I sure do. Cause oh. I, I came for, came to play. 
Praise, so, praise. I got one more fatty to talk about. Uh, this is the last fatty on my list, of which Gruel has many of them. This one I have gained a great appreciation for, thanks to Modern. Uh, there is a fringe deck floating around known as a Gorio's Vengeance deck, uh, and the way that you win with that deck, uh, the, the primary way to win and the most fun way to win is you want to be able to get some, some fatties in your graveyard, specifically my number six. Um, and, well, ideally, first off, let me backtrack. First off, you'd ideally want to get Grizzlebrand out. So you want to get Grizzlebrand in your graveyard somehow. You want to be able to cast Gorio's Vengeance as an instant, get Grizzlebrand out, uh, draw a bunch of cards, use... Uh, uh, there's a green shoal that lets you gain yeah. life by pitching a green card. So you pitch a world spine worm to gain a bunch of life to fuel your grizzle brand, to draw as much as you can before killing yourself. And then you, 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 you have some rituals and you manage to do a through the breach and then you get out this guy and you basically just throw all your lands at the opponent and laugh. Uh, my number six is Borborygmos Enraged. <laughs> Yeah. I love this. Like you have not lived until you've drawn your whole deck and it's been like this many. <laughs> Yeah. So Borborygmos, or as I lovingly refer to him as Bobo, um, costs four, two red, and two green, which is a lot. Uh, seven, six trample. Uh, when Bobo deals combat damage uh, to a player, you can reveal the top three cards of your library, put all land cards revealed that way into your hand, and then uh, the rest into your graveyard. And then he has an activated ability of discard a land. Uh, Borborygmos and Rage deals three damage to target creature or player. So you're getting out Grizzlebrand first, you're drawing with Grizzlebrand, you're pitching any green cards you have to the show, to gain more life, to draw more cards. And when you're just at the right point, when you have enough rituals, when you have enough Simeon Spirit Guides, you cheat out Bobo and you fling a bunch of lands at people and it feels amazing. Um, it's a very fragile combo deck, but when it works, you feel like the prettiest girl on prom night. And um, I just love this card so much. I, I never thought I'd have this much fun casting a card. And fun fact, uh, Borborygmos is actually a fancy term for heartburn. Yes. That's a real word. That's a real description for something. And it's just it's great a, that... It's an audible abdominal sound produced yeah. by hyperactive intestinal perstalsis. Yeah, which is great for a character who assumingly just wants to eat and bash things. And yeah. so I love this card. It's the last fatty on my list. And again, you're not really wanting to, uh, you're not waiting until turn eight to cast it. You're ideally doing it on like turn or three, turn two or turn three. And I think it's great. I think it's, there's it's nourishing shoal is the shoal. Thank you. Room. Thank you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and unfortunately, you can't discard it up to exile in order to make that happen. I went and yeah. looked it up. Um, <clears throat> Borborygmos Borber Enraged is like, I, I, there's a point where like once you see so many numbers and symbols on a card, yeah. they stop existing you're just like <laughs> okay I, yeah, I never your, cast this card your eyes glaze over yeah yeah well, how, how what do i do with this card is it sneak attack is it goro's vengeance <laughs> is it you know whatever do i show and tell this thing because because these numbers are ridiculous there's an eight mana seven six whatever like sh sure cool whatever just show me how i can works. break it yeah and, yeah. and Wizards is like, hey, let's do this thing with lands that never really kind of been done since, uh, <laughs> what, um, what was the Red Enchantment? Uh, seismic Assault. Seismic yeah. Assault, thank you very much. It's like Seismic Assault, you know, plus one. Because On a 7-6, because why not? Yeah. Eh, whatever. <laughs> numbers, man. My, my indelible memory of Borborygmos Enraged is the infamous Brad Carpenter uh, finals of the Star City Games Open, in which he, uh, I believe he, cer he cranial extractioned or slaughter games for Borborygmos. Oh. Yeah. Not Pithing Needle. Pithing Needle. Enraged. Oh, it was Pithing, Pithing Needle. Yeah, it was Pithing Needle. We talked about it on Magic Mike's, and remember the comments were there so we mad go. at me because I, yeah, yeah, I was yeah. agreeing with it. Well, in any case, uh, Brad Carpenter, who is now a, a high-level, like, multiple SCG Open winner, uh, he is at Brad Borygmos on Twitter. Yeah. So shout out to that, wow. at least, for being able to, uh, to, 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 you know, turning a dank meme into his Twitter handle. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> it's all about those dank memes. It's all about those dank memes. <laughs> all right, so we're going to move on here to number five. And once again, we play the Evan doesn't get to talk about magic cards moment. Aww. Ruben, you, you got I'll one? race you. I'll race you. I said I got two. All right. We'll see. Aaron, do you have it's a number the, five? It's the Aaron Campbell comedy hour. Oh, yeah, yeah it is. Apologies to YouTube in advance. <laughs> oh, boy. I thought you had some poor Borygmos there that you were dealing right. with. The Borygmos? You got a little, you, yeah. little, yeah. going on. Acid, little guttural response to the poor Borygmos happening in your in your spilkis. All right, well, it's because enough. we've all eaten so much for the holidays. You know, sure. by Monday, by Tuesday, we just can't eat anymore. So my number five is a card I have a great appreciation for. Uh, fun fact about this card, uh, the proxy guy it is a young man that we all know and love. He makes proxies and wonderful art for the community. And you may not know this, but he has a community binder. 
uh, which he uses to fight his depression. Sometimes he feels sad and he asks people in the community to send him cards that rem- that represent themselves and sign them and then he keeps them when he's feeling blue he pages through and he feels great and uh, the card that I sent him was my number five. Um, it is from the first modern deck I ever played. Um, it kind of sums me up to a certain degree depending on who you ask um, and I just love the art because it's just so creepy. It kind of reminds me of an old Star Trek The Next Generation episode. Um, my number five is Violent Outburst. <laughs> Um, so it's a one colorless, a red and a green. It's an instant with cascade, which we all know and love. And it's whenever you play this spell, you can remove cards from the top of your library from the game until you re- remove a non-land card that costs less. You may play it without paying its mana cost. And then you put the removed cards on the bottom in a random order. Uh, and then creatures you control get plus one, plus one until end of turn. This is another way that the living end decks uh, can cascade into living end, the other being demonic dread. Um, but this one is a little bit better because you don't actually need a creature on the battlefield. Demonic dread requires a creature. Um, And so if you happen to be playing against a deck that doesn't have one, you're forced to either wait for a Fulminator or Beast within your own thing or Beast within their things to have a target. And this doesn't require that. And this is also instant speed, which feels really, really good. Um, I love the art. I love the the memories. It makes me, uh, reminds me of of Living End, my Living End days. Um, I can be a little feisty. And so I I relate to this card a little bit. And uh, I just have a lot of fond memories of, um, especially with things like Simeon Spirit Guide. You know, it's an instant speed. So you can be sitting there with two mana and, you know, you'll be up against a really fast deck like in fact and they'll be like she ain't got three mana and you're like whoop <laughs> um and the card is great i just love everything about it and the art it's just these little creepy purple men like what little... is up with the art i don't know I what's love... happening in the art it's a freaky little weird it's like a it's like a like a like a purple sinister alien people. it's not just like an alien yeah. it's like a like a come it get you it reminds me of the there was an old episode of star trek next generation uh where there were these aliens that only spoke in binary the episode was called like yes oh, i remember that one. that kind of reminds me of that except they've gone mad and their eyes are all red and I- i'm just trying to figure out what a violent outburst has to do with these freaky x-files like reject <laughs> things they, they can get mad it's, it's fine it angry yeah there's they look legitimately pissed for what they are <laughs> Uh, and you know, in the cascade, we get to play that we get to play the like how how small of an ability can we possibly give you for your free spell? Like mm-hmm. you know, you get a hint of lilac. Like that's that's your ability after cascade. Cascade, blah, 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 blah. you smell lavender. Like okay, <laughs> that's that's what you got. Creatures get plus plus oh whatever. At least it doesn't target. Okay, it's yeah, fantastic. Yeah. I mean, honestly, when you think red green cascade spells, you think violent outburst. Um, the, we talked about Demonic Dread on a previous episode. This is the good Cascade. This it doesn't is good cascade. target. It doesn't, uh, it goes at instant speed. This is the one you want. If you could run 10 of these, you just run 10 of these uh, in, in your uh, in your Living End deck. Yeah, it's a good choice. I mean, it's it, it, Living End's not my cup of tea. I'll just, I'll just say <laughs> I wouldn't send a signed Living End as my card. But it looks good <laughs> on you, though. Well, Violent Outburst, <laughs> but sure. Yeah. So we're going to move on here to number four. Now I've got one of these. Hello. I'm pretty excited. I can't, I can't wait. And it's a good one too, which is nice. And of course all the other ones are great because we're going to talk about them here shortly. Right. Um, this one is great. Not only because it showed up later and it was really sweet and made some pro tour play. It's from back in the day when I first learned how to play magic, 1996 in the summer. And there was this, there was this big set called Ice Age, and Ice Age had all sorts of weird, crazy, cool stuff going on. But one of them, like, because again, they didn't really know what they were doing with costing or even, you know, things that have activated abilities or the mana you're going to put in them or whatever. And so Stormbind was this really incredible enchantment that just seemed to like slip through under the radar. Like they were supposed to make it really expensive, but they didn't. And it turned into like an amazing card as a result. Stormbind is a red, a green, and a generic mana for an enchantment. It is a rare in Ice Age and a time shifted card in Time Spiral. Uh, that says two generic mana discard a card at random colon it deals two damage to target creature or player so the ability to just toss things at their face and or their creatures at instant speed whenever you want as much mana and or cards as you've got to throw in there and you're the aggro deck and you're just trying to get them dead that's fine oh i top deck a land i don't care it's very sort of curse scrollish in that way of yeah. that i'm just going to get it and i'm going to throw it and that's cool but you know there was no more curse scroll or the curse scroll didn't even exist way back in the day 
And so this was kind of your option. And this showed up again when Time Spiral happened because Time Spiral had a Time Spiral block Pro Tour where yeah. there were multiple decks that made top 32 of that Pro Tour with Stormbind in them. There were red green aggro decks or red green sort of even some red green ramp stuff had them in there. Like this was in all sorts of different places. It was in cyborgs because it's great against control. Like Stormbind was sweet. I love the artwork. I love that they didn't change the artwork when they brought it back for time shifted. This, this card is terrific and I have nothing but amazing memories of it. Yeah, Saito made top four and Carvalho made top eight, both with Stormbind in the main deck of these of the Time Spiral Pro Tour. And oh, by the way, Ole Rade made top eight with Stormbind in his, or won the tournament with Stormbind in his Red Green Spiders deck as well. Just just a prototypical amazing card. I mean, it's it, it's the inevitability that you want. Every land for the rest of the game turns into two damage. Um, it, it's just a it's a great card. Because typically that effect is really mana intensive, uh, either Borborygmos with the with the red red green green necessitation, or Seismic Assault with red red red, which is really difficult to get down. The easiest one to cast happened in Legends, I think, which is colorless red red on Land's Edge, but that was a reciprocal effect. Both players could use that, and this is just you know for the rest of the game, the worst thing that you can possibly do is shock. Like that's the worst card in your deck, and so right. it's just it's inevitability. Uh, the art is gorgeous. There's yeah. like a, a wind prince princess happening, um, and it's uh, it's just a fabulous card. It is it is terrific, and I I've always loved it, and uh, so and I like it. discarding cards. So yeah, right. that that sounds terrific. When it's my choice, just to be clear, don't right. don't uh, thought seize me, bro. Don't duress no. me. Keep that to yourself. Well, these are at like, random, so this yeah. is like halfway happy. I'm okay with that. Yeah, so. All right. Ruben, what's your number four? I have a number four, and uh, earlier we talked about Atarka, and Atarka's great, but her command is way better. Ooh. So Atarka's command is my number four. Uh, card's bananas. And Card is dumb. Y'all, y'all better recognize. You guys know I love it when cards do well at the Pro Tour. Uh, I also like red aggro decks. And when Atarka's command took down uh, Pro Tour Dragon's Tarkir in the hands of Martin Dang, I was like, "Dang, yo!" And it's the only, <laughs> it's the only green card in the whole gosh darn deck. It's it, they're splashing green just for this card. Wow! You don't you don't need anything else because Atarka's command is so amazing. So it's a red and a green rare uh, from Dragons. It's an instant, and you choose two of the following for your two mana. You get two of these. Your opponents can't gain life this turn. Oh my God. Do you know how much my opponents want to gain life when they're playing against a burn deck? I'll give you a hint. It's a lot. Um, Atarka's Command deals three damage to each opponent. That's usually the combo. That's usually what we're casting it for is Skullcrack You, which right. is cool. Which is cool, but sometimes you can put a land from your hand onto the battlefield, which I, uh, if you have a bunch of the landfall things, like if you're playing the play to Geopede Step Link's uh, version of Zoo, the Naya, the, the Naya Zoo land, landfall deck can sometimes use that. But the other mode that is more often used is creatures you control get plus one, plus one, and gain reach till end of turn. And when you have cards like um, Goblin Rabble Master in your deck, you want to give all your creatures plus one, plus one. Like, if your opponent's tapped out, dealing three damage and glorious anthem antheming for the turn when you have Dragon Fodder and Hordling Outburst in your deck is plenty of damage. It's usually seven or eight damage at that point, um, which is just an absurd uh, amount of output for two mana, one card at instant speed. They couldn't also, make it any cheaper. They no, could. they they literally couldn't. It also is the it also does dumb things with Monastery Swift Spear and giving it an additional prowess mm -hmm. trigger in yeah. addition to the buff that gets out of hand very quickly. Yeah, the only reason I didn't pick this is because I just hate dealing with it. Like it's just my worst nightmare. <laughs> uh, it is so good that it, it essentially replaced Skullcrack. Skullcrack yeah. itself used to be a four of in the burn decks, and because this is just so much more versatile um, and and gives you additional things to do, Skullcrack is now down to like a two of in the main. Maybe sometimes just even a sideboard card. Um, but this card was good enough to replace Skullcrack, which had been a Stable since Return to Ravnica block. And so, um, yeah, the card is very powerful. It's something you're never happy to see. And, um, yeah. <laughs> Skullcrack, for those who don't know, was a uncommon from Gate Crash. It's a red and a generic mana instant. Players can't gain life this turn. Damage can't be prevented this turn. Skullcrack deals three damage to target player. And can I just say, I have played a lot of modern since this card came out. And I can honestly say, I have never, ever, ever had an opponent do the land portion. Yeah, ever. I've never seen... I, I've never... I've never, <laughs> never. Um, Apparently, there are scenarios in which that's a thing you do. I've okay, never yeah. seen them. Yeah. Um, but... 
Certainly, certainly could delete that mode, and it wouldn't make the card any worse. It would be uh, just as good as it is now. It's. I agree, it's but the nice. fact that it has it is 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 nice. I guess it's a, little, it's a bow. I guess on that on that sure. present. Sure. Okay. Whatever. Yeah. I, I, I imagine. I imagine a scenario thing. in cube where I can cast that card and then like put a Caracas into play and bounce my opponent's sneak attack to Emrakul or something like that. But that's about it. See, I, I like the the fact that you know. In many ways, I, we we kind of sort of got a good feel of where our lists are and and who picks what and why. And I was like, you know what, Ruben's got a Targus Command. Yeah. We we've got this. I'll get to talk about Tattermunge Maniac instead of putting a Targus <laughs> Command somewhere and having it be higher on the Don't list. Don't worry, bro, I got you. He's, he's got this. Aaron, what is your number four? My number four is the only higher on my list. All right. Well, we're going to move on here to number three. Do you have a number three, Aaron? I do. Uh, so board wipes tend to be. Very all or nothing. You you rarely get to choose the way they go down. So when Supreme Verdict happens, destroy all creatures. You might have something that is indestructible, or you might have something that regenerates, but they typically everything that can go does go. You know, Languish is minus four, minus four to everything. Damnations destroy everything. Um, but being able to tailor a board wipe to, you know, kind of make you come out ahead in the deal it is a very, very valuable thing. And my number three really exemplifies that. Um, my number three is Fire Spout. Yeah. Um, so Fire Spout was recently reprinted. I really, really like the new art. Um, I didn't really care for the old uh, Shadowmore art too much, but Fire Spout is two and a hybrid mana, either red or green. It's a sorcery. Fire Spout deals three damage to each creature without flying if red was spent to cast Fire Spout, and three damage to each creature with flying if green was spent to cast it. So if you happen to be playing a deck with a lot of creatures on the ground, you're obviously weak to flyers, and so you can sort of tailor this uh, to be able to only affect flying creatures and so your people on the ground stay safe. Um, or that's the, the reverse is true. You have a bunch of flyers and you just don't want to deal with anything on the ground. Or if you just want to stay to heck with it and kill everything, you can also do that too. And so I really like that this gives you control uh, in that regard because with a lot of board wipes, you just sort of have to take whatever comes with and hope that you uh, you end up on the better better end of that. And I really like that this gives you the the choice to do that. This is something that the uh, this is something that's used vintage play. The Oath decks like to use this. This is something Tron decks also have been known to use in modern to get rid of like little things that are in the way um because tron is sometimes weak to aggro decks and and is really limited by color it, you know all his dust is very expensive and so i really like the versatility of the card this is a card that is definitely seen play in multiple formats which i really respect uh and that is why it is my number three yeah this I, was my sorry this was my uh number uh six. Oh, aha now the fire spout in and of itself is is a terrific card. Obviously, even to this day, uh, the artwork has me kind of torn because like Raymond Swanland is an absolute ridiculous master. But you go over here to the Jeff Miracola one, and Jeff Miracola like has this thing about goblins, and he makes really silly goblins, and it's ridiculous mm -hmm. goblin flying up into the air and stuff. Uh, th this was supposed to be like okay, fairies is done now. This was it. Fairies is out. Mm -hmm. GG. No more fairies all over standard. And it's like uh, uh, Miss Bind Click has four toughness. I don't know if <laughs> Knew that, but that's a right. reality, and so that kind of that kind of happens. So like, yeah, you can get rid of the bitter blossom tokens, and then you're going to get killed by a four four. But whatever, right. um, <laughs> still a great card. It does amazing things. You know, if anything, it it stopped a lot of the aggro decks because it's so good against the aggro decks. Whereas you have the tempo decks in the terms of a bitter blossom whatnot. Like they might be able to, you know, they might have cryptic command mana by the right. time you get around to fire spouting. Exactly. They they have Muta Vaults and Mistbind Clicks in their deck. It's not gonna I remember when fairies adopted putting fire spouts in their sideboards <laughs> to be able to kill like opposing Magus of the Moons. Like they just yeah. didn't have red in their deck. Yeah. They just had fire spouts. It was ridiculous. Um, this was also a main deck card in a Pro Tech Pro Tour winning deck in uh, uh, Philadelphia in twenty eleven. The first modern Pro Tour Samuel Estrati uh, had three main deck uh, fire spouts and a uh, uh, fellow top eight competitor Alessandro Portaro also had a couple uh, in both of their Splinter Twin decks. Um, so just a just a card that has a, a lot of tournament pedigree as well. I, f I faced down a lot of sp fire spouts. Not a lot of cards that I hate more uh, when I'm playing Kithkin than my opponent's fire spout. Not a happy time for for Ruben Bressler when that happens. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, uh, <clears throat> it is very rare to find any spell that deals three damage to each creature. Uh, yeah, I, I'm literally flame looking. break. I think is one. Flame break is one. Slagstorm is red, one. Red, red, Slagstorm's a good one. Sweltering suns. Anger of the gods. You yep. know, there's. It's not that it's impossible, but the 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 other part of it is that you can choose the mode. You can right. yeah. You, you can just fight. You can do the skies. If you have a bunch of stuff on the ground and your opponent has a bunch of this the fairy tokens, then you can pay only the green and hurricane. Right. Um, which is also super sweet. 
which is super powerful and whenever you get the ability to change things as you see fit. Ruben, what's your number three? My number three, uh, we, we touched on briefly when we were talking about werewolves, uh, but now we're going to talk about the real Red Green Werewolf, mm, everybody. Real. Uh, Hunt Mas- the master, Hunt Master of the Fells, there you go. Uh, is my number three choice. Um, you know, I, I like tournament pedigree. Obviously, this was uh, the one of the staple cards of the Channel Fireball deck at Pro Tour Dark Ascension. Probably the best roster of top eight players ever assembled. Um, like four Hall of Famers, I think, were in the top it eight. It was insane. It was, it was PV and Finkel and Kibler and Yelger. It was just absurd. And two of the players, PV and Kibler, the eventual winner, had four main deck Huntmaster of the Fells. Um, I'm pretty sure Huntmaster of the Fells also is the magic card that has the most words on it. Partially because <laughs> it has two sides. Um, yeah. I would have to I would have to get fact checked on that. But in any case, Huntmaster of the Fells is a two colorless red and green human werewolf originally from Dark Ascension. It's a two-two. When this creature enters the battlefield or transforms into Huntmaster of the Fells, create a 2-2 green wolf creature token, and you gain two life. At the beginning of each upkeep, if no spells were cast last turn, transform Huntmaster of the Fells. And then, on the back, is Ravager of the Fells, which is just a werewolf, not a human werewolf, just a werewolf. Still red and green, color identity, but it's a 4-4 trampler, and when this creature transforms into Ravager of the Fells, it deals 2 damage to target opponent and 2 damage to up to 1 target creature that player controls at the beginning of each upkeep. If a player casts 2 or more, two or more spells last turn, transform Ravager of the Fells. That was a long story. Ooh, a lot of words sure out was. of your face. But, uh, but yeah, that card's amazing. Um, has seen play uh, also in the weird rug three color deck that shoot that uh, I think it was who brought that deck I think it was Shuhei brought it to Worlds mm. where you you could vial it in and then just automatically flip it, wow. um, which was kind of adorable. That was that weird cryptic command eternal witness deck. Ah, I with remember the that. Files that was the he brought the ham sandwich and just destroyed he brought the everyone. The ham sandwich and just yeah, just murderized every <laughs> single person. Huntmaster just being two four power for four mana across two bodies, gaining you that little bit of life, little bit of incremental advantage. Uh, flipping, gaining you more incremental advantage. Flipping back, gaining you a little bit. You know, it's just a solid workhorse card. And of course, the brand new uh, uh, art from Magale Villanueva. Oh uh, everything from, from the vault transform makes buying from the vault transform worth it i mean both halves of it are just beautiful the card's amazing uh german versions are called jägermeisters and so are highly what? sought after collectors I yeah they, they're jägermeisters because they're the hunt masters oh, um and oh so God. collectors look for jägermeisters uh, uh pretty heavily but uh but yeah hunt master of the fells a lot of great memories for everybody uh, that's ever played that card. Um, it's it's just it's it's just such a good card. It has the Pro Tour pedigree. What's not to love? Believe believe me when I say this. No one saw this card coming. No, no one. Yeah. When, when, right before the Pro Tour, no one had talked about this card at all. Yeah. And CFB was freaking out over it. And it's a game in and of itself. It's like you know you have to kind of ask yourself you know I can do something this turn or I uh, am I in such a place where I can safely pass the turn and just sort of get to flip in and and just being able to craft your turns to where I think I want to flip it now. No, I think I'm okay with it flipping back and um, it just drips value. You know it, Liliana of the Veil was in this standard and even in modern and it's insurance against that. You know being able to make a creature that goes along with it is really cool. The flipping ability, just being able to pick things off. Uh, uh, it's very dangerous when you pair it with a uh, uh, Kessig Wolf Run was a card that this went along with really well. And it just has the ability to take over games by itself. You know, that's something that's really uh, unique to Jun decks. You know, they want haymakers. Like, they don't run very many creatures, but the few creatures they do run, like Olivia, Scavenging Goose, this, if you leave it alone, you can win the game with just this if you play it correctly. And I really think that that card, you know, exemplifies Jun, and that's why it sees yeah. play in Modern and, and saw play in Standard. And, you know, I think it was so powerful that, you know, Ulrich kind of had to pay for that because we couldn't very well have another Huntmaster on our hands. And uh, yeah, the card is just fantastic. And again, Magali just, oh, just making you love it even more. Now, is yeah. it, again, Villanueve or Villanov? 
Villanueve I, is what I, I say. I say Villanueve, but I could have sworn somebody had corrected us. So. I thought it was Villanueve, yeah. and I was corrected. It might be Villanueve. Because I said she's Villanueve. She's just epic, and I just love I her. I don't know. She's amazing. Magali is yeah. Magali. unbelievable. The, to me, uh, to give kind of a comparison, I would say this compares exactly to the uh, Pro Tour Theros, where Thassa just, like, was in everything yeah. and yeah. showed up everywhere. And you're like, <laughs> what, 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 that card wasn't supposed to be that good. It was supposed yeah, to be awful. Right. Yeah, the card yeah. was ridiculous. And Huntmaster, yeah. and I'll be, I honestly think this is part of it. I know, I know it's kind of weird, but I think the art isn't that striking. The original Dark Ascension art was not that bold, was not that amazing. Sure, it didn't out. stand out for right. sure. It, if anything, it's kind of sort of dreary. It's very brown. You know, yeah, it's I mean, not, not just doesn't a lot, jump out To be you. fair, though, a lot of the cards from Dark Ascension were very dreary. Like, that sure. was part of the art direction. Nothing. Yeah. I don't think anything really stood out. Right? Like, even you look at the bright spirits, like you think of Drogskull Captain from the same Pro Tour right. top eight from what, that we talked about last week with it's the Azorius. Yeah. It's still a pretty dim card, even though it's a spirit that has a shining beacon shining out from its chest, and it's a pirate <laughs> ghost. It's still, like, kind of dreary. Like, it doesn't yeah. really... So, in much the same way, I, I think... I just I just get that feeling from all of the Dark Ascension cards. And so that might be part of it. Is part of it is you, the animal brain, the reptilian brain is like, eh, it doesn't look delicious to me. I don't think I'll eat it. Right? <laughs> it's sort of like that that base level. This was my number six. My uh, number four. Nice. So we all we all had it. It's it's definitely yeah, worth course. inclusion. And I, again, that art upgrade was insane. It's just mm, yeah. one of the best. But moving on here to my number three. Now my number three, I, I like it for a lot of different reasons. One, it's a very very powerful card. Two, it's seen just infinite tournament play. And three, neither I nor Brad Nelson. Gave a crap about this thing. We crapped on this card so hard. It was silly. It was, it's like, it just, it's, it's very embarrassing to go back and watch us review Burning Tree Emissary. Burning Tree Emissary uh. is a two gruel mana, two hybrid mana, two, two. It's an uncommon human shaman from Gate Crash, and it's only got one ability. It says when it enters the battlefield, you add a red and a green to your mana pool. <laughs> This card is free. You know Dumb. what's busted? Free cards. Yeah. Cards that replace everything about themselves in yeah. terms of mana cost. This card is bananas, and my god, we just crapped all over it and just sent it packing. We're like, GG, Tutu, you suck. You know, they're like Frogmite saw any play or anything, and that was just right. straight free. Exactly. It didn't actually give you mana back. Literally Frogmite. Is oh what my this god, card is. this card is this, amazing, this and card I love suffers. it. This card suffers from the same problem as Siege Rhino. You know, when Siege Rhino was really popular, people used to describe them as being like Pringles and that you very, very you very rarely ever saw a siege rhino there were usually there was usually one coming up the rear mm. or, or there was one coming and i felt the same way with this card you very rarely ever saw one burning tree emissary i can remember being on the receiving burning tree emissary burning tree emissary blah and you're just like come oh. on whenever like, i drew three or four <laughs> i would always i would always get like tap my mana and then gather all three of them out and then go and they like spread them out on the board all together there's and you still had mana left over. You still yeah. have There's an archetype in modern that still uses this card. They call it Eight Whack. Eight Whack. Um, as a variation of Eight Rack, which is the mono black discard deck. Uh, there's a version of this that runs this card and uh, the new goblin, one of the new goblins right. from Battle of Reckless Resentfire. Bushwhacker and yep. Goblin Bushwhacker. And so you essentially go, boop, 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 play that. Yeah. They all have haste and you're just dead. And this card is scary you're never happy to see it you're always kind of holding onto the table like just bracing yourself because you know some nonsense is going to happen and, and brad nelson brought this deck into standard with the naya blitz deck this yeah deck, this card uh this card was was responsible for more turn three kills in standard than any combo at the time um, um I mean, when you had three or four in hand, hand you could just yeah. you, not only would you flood <laughs> the board you had mana left over yeah so, yeah so you'd go emissary emissary another two drop or two one drops. Yeah. Right? You go you go like turn one like uh, experiment one. Yeah. Turn two emissary emissary cur like curd ape another experiment one. Not in that order. You'd probably play them in the other way. But you get my yeah. point. The point um, is it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous card. Uh it's a free 2/2 two -two, just like Frogmite. It was super powerful. This was my number 5. Um you knew it was going to be on there uh and and the burning tree uh clan represented finally in the top 8. I mean, it's one thing to be good, but for me to have that personal, like, you remember when Brad and I crapped all over this thing? Yeah. Yeah, oh, that was man. a good one. 
It was it was beautiful. All right, so we're going to move on here. I think we have that's a, is that everybody's number three. That was number three. Yep. Yeah. All right, so we're going to move on here to number two. Now I don't have one because I am ninety nine point nine percent sure it's Ruben's number one. But Ruben, do you have a number two? I do. When you talk about pro tour dominance, when you talk about archetypes that have lived for decades with people not even probably even knowing where the archetype comes from from the beginning. Um, when you talk about the history of the game, you talk about fires. Fires of Yavi Maya is my number two. Wow. Um, Pro Tour Chicago was is another of those top eights that's in the running for the most prestigious names of all time. Kai Buddy, John Finkel, Michael Puslinik, Zvi Mauschewitz, Brian Kibler, Robert Doherty, Camille Cornelson, and Jay Ellerar. Jay Ellerar is probably the only one that people aren't going to know about, but he was a, he was a relatively well-known name back in the day. Michael Puslinik, I guess at this point people don't remember. But bit. the rest of those are like six of the top 15 players of all time, including the top oh, four two. Four or five right? Hall of Famers there? Well, Kai, John, Zvi, Kibler, Rob Doherty, Camille Cornelson, six. Wow. Six, six Hall of Famers. And of the eight players in this top eight, four played fighters. Four of them played Fires archetypes. John Finkel, Puslinik, Zvi, and Rob Doherty all played Fires of Yavi Maya. Fires of Yavi Maya, F- Fires of Yavi Maya, for those of you who are unaware, colorless, red, green, uncommon from invasion, enchantment. Creatures you control have haste. And sacrifice Fires of Yavi Maya. Target creature gets plus two, plus two till end of turn. Mm. Pretty simple, right? Yeah, all right? Doesn't seem terribly broken. You got the fervor. Given all your creatures haste, you got like the one-time pump effect. But here, the reason why it was so broken is because this was in standard with an enchantment called Sapperling Burst, um, which was a rare from Nemesis uh, that was four colorless and a green and had fading of seven and allowed you to put in Sapperlings that had power and toughness equal to the number of... that, that had power and toughness equal to the number of fading counters that were left on Sapperling Burst. And so this was fair if they had to sit and play for a turn. Because if you made three ca- counters, there'd be three to- uh, uh, three tokens. You'd have three counters left on your burst. You'd only have three three threes. That's nine power. But you can make three four fours or four three threes on turn five and be attacking with all of them. Jesus. Not to mention the fact that this deck also had Blasted Urm to play the turn afterwards. You had Birds of Paradise and Land of War Elves to ramp into a turn two fires. So a very <laughs> common line of play would be turn one Birds, turn two fires, turn three Blasted Urm, attack you for five, turn four Sapperling Burst, attack you for 17. Wow. Man. That's a lot. That's a lot of damage. It's an insane you. amount. It, it really puts part of you know, part of V Mauschwitz's pedigree, part of yeah. you know his legacy, part of when you look back and you go, why was V important? That deck was one of the reasons he was incredibly yes. important. And, and, and all decks that have Llanowar Elves in them should just be praying at the altar of Zvi Mauschewitz, and this is no exception. Anyone who knows, he he can take advantage of a 1-1-for-1 one, one one that taps for mana better than any human on the planet, and he knew how to do it with his Fires deck, that's for sure. Fires of Yavamai was my number seven because its impact on magic history is hard to undersell. It's hard to say that it didn't literally rotate the format around its existence. The The line of text that all of your creatures have haste is a very, very dangerous one. Not yeah. necessarily just for sapling burst, just in general. Like, your creatures have haste? Oh, God. Because that means you're basically <laughs> skipping every turn when you play a creature. You don't have that, you know, here's a turn for you to do things about it and think about it and play some blockers and whatever. No, no, no. My good guys are coming. They're coming for you. And then it, it also just creates insane combat scenarios where you're like, well, who do I block? Because yeah. I can do plus two plus do anything. If you drew multiples, you could play multiples. And then that gets even crazier in terms of, like, yes, you have the turn five, you know, um, insane draw. But sometimes you just draw multiples of this card or you don't get the sapling yeah. until super late. And you just start making combat really weird blastoderm being insane a four mana five five haste that you cannot do anything to it has a shroud you have to wrath it or you're going to die that's insane that's and also it it also should be noted that in terms of famous magic the gathering articles and article series zvi mauschewitz's my fires series was top top three all-time article series if you want to know how to break down a deck how to build a deck from the ground up get inside of zvi mauschewitz's brain and figure out how he works and how he develops an archetype and how he creates these decks for these pro tours the my fires series is where it 
begins. Like, this was the first kind of uh, deck tech kind of thing that had ever been written. Like, at this point, people are like, here's my deck, here's how I built it, and here's how it works. Here's a sideboarding guide, and that's just how you write magic articles. Yeah. My Fires was the first one that did that. And so you go back and read it, and you're just like, oh, this is just him explaining why he put his cards in his deck. That's like watching The Godfather and seeing when they shoot up the car and being like, oh, I've seen that in dozens of other mob movies. Well, The Godfather <laughs> did it first. So yeah. He is literally the godfather of this type of article. So you should definitely go Google My Fires by Zvi um, and, and and just see how it all started. And uh, and, my, and Fires of Yavi Maya is a big reason why, because th that card is ridiculous and that deck is ridiculous. Well, you could read it on the sideboard.com, which was used Absolutely. to be Wizards, <laughs> Wizards content arm used to be that. But uh, Aaron, what is your number two? My number two, you know, we're, we're getting to that point where I, I start looking for the multi-format All-Stars. And, and I wasn't around for Standard when this card was Standard Legal. I assume it's saw Standard Play. You two can obviously feel free to correct me, but it's definitely seen Modern Play. It's definitely seen Legacy Play. It is the staple of uh, combo decks everywhere, uh, specifically Modern Storm. And uh, Belcher loves it in Legacy. Uh, it, it just it, There's just no downside to really playing it. Uh, my number two is Manamorphos. Um, so Manamorphos costs one or a hybrid red and a green. It's an instant. You add two mana of any combination of colors to your mana pool. Uh, and then you draw a card. So it replaces itself. Uh, you really just don't lose anything. You get your mana back. You also get up a card. Um, and when you're playing a combo deck like Modern Storm, you're able to, uh, when you have things like Goblin, like Goblin, go <laughs> it's in there somewhere. It's in there. Goblin Electromancer uh, or Baral, this costs one. So you're paying one mana and getting two mana out of the deal. That's value right there. Um, it's very easy to build your storm count with this to get exactly the mana that you need, um, whether you need a blue for gifts ungiven or if you're playing Belcher, you want to be able to get the mana you need for that. Um, and it's just a beautiful card. There's just probably levels to it I don't even comprehend myself. Um, but I do know it's seen play in multiple formats and it is the reason why these decks exist. I tend to be a fan of the newer art. You know, we kind of talked about with fire spout there's the original art and there's sort of the newer art i like the newer art of sort of the rainbow hand um mm -hmm. i think that's a lot prettier than the kind of weird barbed wire things in the hand i don't really get that but i love this card i have a great appreciation of metamorphos um and and i like doing broken things and so that's why it's my number two the shadow more one is <laughs> yeah. just ugly it's thank just, you <laughs> it's seriously little, it's not great it's yeah. not I'm this was my this was my number eight Okay. Um, certainly well deserving of being on the list, if for no other reason than it's so different from everything on the yeah. list. Um, it's the only card that sees play in anything that isn't really like an aggro deck, although Fire Spout, I guess, uh, uh, sort of changes, but either aggro or ramp or like, you know, sort of combat based control uh, kind of stuff. But yeah, Manamorphos is in a totally different kind of sphere. Um, yeah, sees play in all manner of unfair combo decks and probably the only gruel card. That sees play in those quote unquote unfair archetypes. I mean, yeah. you think about how nuts we were going over Burning Tree Shaman, and then you think, what if it emissary? was easier to. Or, I'm emissary. Sorry, emissary, not yeah. Shaman. I keep getting those messed up. Oh, you're good. Uh, Burning Tree Emissary. And you say, well, what if it was easier to cast, and instead it just gave you both that mana and a card instead of the 2 2? Would you, would you like the card instead of a 2? <laughs> right. Would yeah. that bust anything? Sometimes. Uh, yeah, this saw lots and lots of play. Uh, if nothing else, it, it helped fix your mana. If you were in a three-color deck or whatever, uh, obviously did its most impactful work into the Storm decks and whatnot, who were just like loving this thing from day one because it's silly. Uh, I mean, even to this day, it's only had two printings. It's been printed in Shadow Moor mm -hmm. with terrible art and Modern Masters with amazing art, and both of those things are like $7. So, like, whatever. So you have your $7 on commons because this card, you, you play zero or four of. You do not play one Manamorphose. You don't play two in the sideboard. You are for manamorphosing if you are manamorphosing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. Absolutely. So we're going to roll here to number one. Ruben, what is your number one? I share a wow. number one with Aaron, which was your number two. Sure was. My God, so Ruben. I think that you know where we're at. Oh, I know exactly where you're at, buddy. <laughs> you're almost on the same cycle. You're you're very close. <laughs> you, you need to adjust. You we need to synchronize our watches just a little bit better. But so what is it? Our number one, Aaron. Would you like to do the honors, or shall I? Uh, I will. I, I I'll certainly lead, and you can you can finish. Okay. So this card, let it let it go. Let it loose. Let it free. It's time. It it, it did nothing wrong. 
Oh, Free blood braid out. It was, yeah, it, out of was, here. it was arrested for the crimes of another. Let it, wow. It's fine. It's fine. My, tell him why it's fine, Ruben. Bloodbird Elf is fair magic. Hashtag sure. fair magic. <laughs> Bloodbird Elf is two colorless, red, green, for a 3-2 with haste and has the ability Cascade. Mm. Uh, perhaps better known on the card Violent Outburst, which we were referenced earlier. Um, yeah, this card is Jund. This is the Jund card, right? This is the reason why your black green deck plays red other than Lightning Bolt. Um, ever since it started in standard, when you would go Batuminous, Batuminous Blast into Blood Braid. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, with, with friends like Sprouting Thrynax hanging around, and you'd had Broodmate Dragon in that deck as well. Uh, and then it started taking over Modern, right? And it started out, uh, you know, Pro Tour Return to Ravnica was a modern event that was dominated by Jund, like 30% of the metagame. Uh, eventually won by Stanislav Sivka's Eggs, but the finals had Yuya Watanabe in the top eight, running the full play set. Um, you know, I think that Channel Fireball had had uh, was playing the Jund deck as well, including David Ochoa, who also made that top eight. Um, LSV started... Um, a Pro Tour 16 and 0 with a Naya deck featuring four copies of Bloodbraid Elf. Naya Lightsaber, I think, was the name of that deck. <laughs> um, which that deck wasn't particularly good, but also just speaks to the power of Bloodbraid Elf yet again. Um, there are two multicolored cards, two multicolored cards that are on the modern, banned, and restricted list. And one of them deserves to be in there, and the other one is why Bloodbraid Elf, and, and that one is also why Bloodbraid Elf is on the banned list. Bloodbraid Elf paid for the sins of Deathrite Shaman. Yeah. Deathrite Shaman can stay right where it, where it is. It knows what it did. Bloodbraid Elf can get out and 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 be Blood, and be free. Bloodbraid Elf is is was the lid that kept Jace the Mind Sculptor in inside a little box at Any least amount for a of check. while for just yeah. a small amount of time. The ability to have Three mana power hasty is is very important because they gave us the uncommon four mana three three artifact creature in Ether yeah. Revolt and we're like oh my god is it blood rate no it's not blood rate there there is a difference <laughs> when you can swing for three whether it's at planeswalkers or their face or whatever and in addition to getting that card uh, that is just an amazingly powerful thing it's not something I, I personally I feel like this card is busted and silly. I was there at Pro Tour Hollywood. I'm talking to R&D, and this was, you know, the sort of the Alara, the Alara Reborn yeah. Pro Tour, as it were. And I was just like, "What are you doing? Why <laughs> did you make this thing?" You know, and again, it was just like, "But it's fun, right?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I guess. I mean, I'm having fun when I'm destroying my opponent, and they, <laughs> and then you know, their hopes and dreams fall from their face, and sadness falls over the land. But like, <sighs> Blood Rail, this thing." This thing has been reprinted six times. It's banned in modern, the only constructed format that you'd probably expect it to see play, and it's still like two to three dollars. Well, like, it sees play in Legacy Jun when when that deck creeps out. You know? I will also say yeah, that Caleb Durward won a Legacy Open in forever ago in mo in Mental Misstep Standard or wow. Mental Misstep Legacy. He was playing Rug Zoo. He had uh, Bloodbraid Elf and Jace fighting together in the same deck. Wow. Uh, along with Wild Nakatles and Brainstorms. That was I love a it. mix up. That was a hilarious deck. But it just speaks to the power, yet again, of Bloodbraid Elf. That, that card, it warps things around itself. But as I want to do, I, I had to. There, there's a personal connection that overrode feelings. Yeah. And overrode what I feel that, you know, the default's the default, okay? Mm -hmm. And sometimes the default has to be different for me because I make a lot of magic content. I've made a lot of magic content. I've been all over this great world of ours because of magic. And back, if you bring it all the way back to 2006, you, you'd go and, and I, I kind of started getting fascinated with this card because my buddy Chris, who I'm still best friends with to this day, Shout uh, out to Chris Millard. Yeah, yeah, my buddy and my pal. And he came up with the best nickname of all time. And it was for the card Giant Solifuge. So say hello oh. to say hello to Captain Tickles. <laughs> Captain Tickles is two red, you know, two gruel mana, two hybrid mana, and two generic mana for a four one rare insect. It has trample, haste, and shroud. That's what it does. It comes and it gets you and 
He's going, he's going to get you. He's going to be tickling all over you. It is, for some reason, something about Captain Tickles is so silly and, and ridiculous and amazing. Like, yeah. I, I was, I sang songs about it. Like, you can go back and look. It's just absolutely absurd. And I do feel, I mean, I honestly feel that some of that silliness that this card provided, that that nickname gave me, that I was able to kind of use that, work with that, and everybody have a good time with it, was one of the reasons that I got to go to the Invitational, which is one of the reasons I got to go to my first Pro Tour, and I got to meet Magic R&D, and it was just, it, I feel like it definitely set part of my career as it is right now because of this silly little spider i have signed dozens and dozens of these things over the years i love it got to the point where they uh at cool stuff they had bought a collection and they brought me the four giant solo fuse that i had signed for somebody and they just like here you go this is fun. yeah whatever it's like it's not a great tournament card it was pretty fun and it's pretty it was, good back in the day it was a good card back in the day it was but no longer and and yeah. but at this point and it was it was reprinted in eternal masters which is appreciated with some new art which looks really cool by Svetlan Belanov but you know but in my heart this will always be Captain Tickles yep this It'll probably be. would have been in my top 10 had I not immediately known that it was going to be your number one <laughs> um and I was like I already got one red green spider on my list nice. um but yeah this was another part of that Gruel Beats deck that won the Pro Tour again mm -hmm. the Pro Tour pedigree um and you can't beat the you know Captain Tickles, <laughs> Captain Tickles, swinging in the red zone for our team. Captain Tickles, Captain Tickles, swinging in the red zone for our team. I don't know. I want to hear the trap remix. I want the version. Yeah. Of Ego oh City. my God! If you have the video, if any, if we have any viewers out there, Spruik, get on this. We need a trap <laughs> remix. I'm still waiting for the. By the way, I'm still waiting for the Spruik uh, Unstable album. Oh, I think man. that would be hot fire. But oh, yeah, um, so the Giant Solo Fuge, just a, a great tournament card and obviously a, a huge part of, uh, of Mr. Orange's career. Yeah, it really was. I really do feel that way. So that said, that brings us to the end of our top 10 cards in Gruel. You will see them on screen now for review. You may take a look at my list. Aaron's list and Ruben's top 10 and we want to hear from you about what card we did not talk about and we'll select our favorite to win a $50 gift certificate to coolstuffinc.com but before I go I want to thank my co-hosts thank you Aaron thank you for having me and Merry Christmas Merry Christmas Ruben thank you this was less grueling than I thought <laughs> you've been waiting all episode to say that ain't you you've been waiting the whole time oh man good, good job, it's buddy. a very easy pun to make so the clap is slow sir the clap is yeah. slow all right, so I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, our co-sponsor, CardHoarder.com, my co-hosts, Aaron Campbell and Ruben Bressler. You guys for watching, and I hope you support us at Patreon.com slash Magic Mics. Visit our website at MagicMicsPodcast.com that exists thanks to our Patreon supporters, or follow, like, tweet, favorite, share, subscribe, do everything social that tells people we exist. Catch us online at Twitch.tv slash Magic Mics, on Twitter at Magic Mics, cast on Reddit at Reddit.com slash R slash Magic Mics, and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Magic Mics. Talk to us privately at Magic Mics Podcast at gmail.com. Follow the audio-only podcast at Magic Mics Podcast at Libsyn.com or find us on iTunes or join us here next week for another top 10 episode of Magic Mike's. Good night, everybody. <laughs>